Open your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to pick up where we left off last time in verse 18 in a Bible study that I've entitled, Jesus Preached to the Spirits in Prison. Jesus Preached to the Spirits in Prison. And we'll see what that looks like in just a moment. Now, our study last time was so encouraging as we learned a very important doctrinal truth. I even taught you a new theological word. We learned about the vicarious atonement of Jesus. And it was right there in verse 18. Notice with me again in 1 Peter chapter 3 in verse 18. We learned that Christ suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Jesus suffered once, not twice, not perpetually, but once. We live today by faith in his finished work. We don't trust in a church. We don't trust in an institution. We don't trust in a man. We don't even trust in a, in a series of teachings. We trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It is his work, not our perpetual works. He's finished the work of salvation. And I know this is repeated so much, but it, you can't hear it enough. You are saved, forgiven of your sins, brought into a right relationship with God, not because you are good, not because you do good, not because you're religious or you do many religious things, None of that. The key to your relationship with God is the suffering, vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ. He died the just for the unjust, you and me. And we are saved and forgiven because of his suffering, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And it really is a sad thing to me and grieves my heart because I know that many churches, many organizations teach that there is no way you can be assured of your salvation. And they just keep you hanging and keep you hanging and keep you hanging. And, and that, what that does is keep you on a place of, I want to do good, I've got to do good. And you live under an environment of guilt and shame and condemnation. And you never really have that assurance. And some go so far to say is you will never have that assurance until you meet God face to face. Well, let me just say for many people, that will be too late, meeting God face to face. Because you can do many moral good things and not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you won't find that out until you meet Jesus face to face when he says, hey, you, here you are, account for your life. And you, and you will respond, well, I did this for you and I did this for you and I did this for you and, and I lived my life for you. And Jesus says, no, depart from me. You workers of iniquity, why? Because I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. It's not, heart, it's not the heart of God to control you and to manipulate you and to guilt you into some sort of perpetual religious action so that in many ways your conscience is, is appeased, but your spirit is troubled. A spirit is always troubled. The inside of us is always troubled when we're distant from God. And you know, it's possible to be in church. It's possible to be very uh, active uh, religiously. It's possible to read the Bible. It's possible to pray with people. It's possible to do good deeds and still be entirely lost. And it's God's heart for you to come to this place with just this one verse. And this is what we studied last time. And I'd encourage you to pick it up if you weren't with us. The object of faith is not a human, not a teacher, not a church, not a movement, not a priest. It's not even faith. The object of our faith is a person. Remember in Hebrews chapter 12, jot it down in verse 1, it says, Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run our race with endurance that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 18, so powerful, so easy to understand, so plain, 
It's a beautiful, I wish the whole Bible was as easy to understand as verse 18 because when we come to verse 19, not so easy to understand. Notice in verse 19, by whom also he, speaking of Jesus, went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. This also is an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now, some have called this the most difficult paragraphs in all the Bible. And so let's jump in and see what God has for us beginning in verse 19. So we have the vicarious atonement, the suffering of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, the death and resurrection. And then in verse 19, he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So we move to one of the most precious, clearest, wonderful verses in the Bible, to a tough one. But I don't want you to be intimidated when you're reading through the Bible and you come to passages that you don't understand. Perhaps even after today's Bible study, it may still not be as clear as you want it to be, but we allow the word of God to come into our lives. We allow the word of God, we receive it as is, and we're not entirely, don't be so entirely or quickly discouraged because you don't understand everything. It's okay that you don't understand, especially some of these challenging passages. On the other hand, though, we can gain greater understanding as we're studying it together. God has a reason for us. He has a lesson for us to learn. It says here in verse 19 that Jesus preached to spirits in prison. So the question is, where and when did he do this? So let's walk together through this. Let's go back to the time. Turn your Bible now to Luke chapter 23. And let's look at the time where Jesus was hanging on a Roman cross. Jesus, now we're going to go back to the time right before his death. He's hanging on the cross, and he looks over at one of the others that is hanging next to him. Notice Luke 23 in verse 42. Luke 23, verse 42. It says, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Let me get to the right one. He says, and then Jesus, and then said, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Verse 43. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 44, it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So after Jesus dies here, and after he died, where was his body? Well, we learn in the scriptures that after he died, he was placed into a tomb. And there his body lay for three days according to his promise. Well, what's his promise? Turn over to Matthew now. Notice with me in Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, in verse 38. Jesus' body was put into the tomb. And then some of the scribes and the Pharisees, this is Matthew 12, 38, answered and saying, teacher, we wanted you to see a sign. We want to see a sign for you. And he answered, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So where did Jesus' spirit go? Well, we know that Jesus' spirit went to paradise. In Romans chapter 10, verse 7, it says, Who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, 
So you put pieces together. It says, now this he ascended, speaking of Jesus, he says, now this he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So we have the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and then the activity of Jesus. You'll remember I mentioned even this last past Easter in our, in our message together that when Jesus declared it is finished, he didn't say he was finished. So he was referring to a specific event or a specific finished work, which would be, we learn, the work of salvation. But Jesus wasn't finished. There was still much more that would flow from his life. So his body is in the tomb. His spirit, his spirit is moving in ministry. Notice now Luke chapter 16. Come over with me to Luke chapter 16. So we often think of Jesus just being laid in the tomb and no activity. And that was just done. But notice with me in Luke 16, verse 22, it says, well, pick up in verse 19, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And what makes this parable unique is that Jesus uses names. He doesn't use names in any other parable, which leads us to conclude that this was a true story and that it is a true story of exactly what's, it's like, it's like a peek into eternity. Like, like we're able to see what the eternal state is like. So here he is, he says, there was a certain rich man, verse 19, who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that as the beggar died, he was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. Mark that, Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that may he dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, verse 26, between us and you is a great goal fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from here there pass to us. And they said, well, I beg you therefore, father, that you would send them to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to them, they have Moses and the prophets. Basically, they have the word of God. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Before Jesus died, no one ever experienced the removal of sin. The sacrificial system of the old covenant was merely a covering of sin, not a removal. That's why every year the high priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice and the scapegoat, and he would go in and spread the, the blood on the mercy seat on behalf of the people, and he would come on and put his bloody hands on the scapegoat, and it would run away, being a symbolism not only of the blood that the mercy seat, representing Jesus Christ, would be the covering of sin, but pointing forward to the removal of sin with the scapegoat. So prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, men and women lived under a different covenant or agreement with God. And they lived their life looking forward to the promise of the Savior before his death and resurrection. They could not go directly to heaven. Why? 
because Jesus had not yet died for their sins. He had not yet removed. In all these years, his, their sins were covered and overlooked, but there would come a day promised by God where the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world and bring complete justification, complete sanctification, and complete glorification of their lives. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, it says, these all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having them seen them afar off, they were assured of them. And they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those that died before Christ didn't experience what you experience. And so the blood of Jesus was not yet shed or experienced. When those under the old covenant died, they went to the good side of Hades. And you go ahead, where do you get that from? Luke chapter 16. You have Hades separated into two compartments. You have Abraham's bosom and you have the torment side of Hades or you could say that, and there's a great gap fixed between them. You have Abraham's bosom and you have Hades and there's a great gap. And you have people that are on Abraham's bosom receiving comfort and encouragement and you have those in torments um, absolutely overwhelmed that their friends and family, they, they, they are still alive and they had conscious understanding that they weren't right in relationship with God. The Bible tells us that Jesus went and preached to them and led them from their captivity. Not only that, the prison was death by which people were bound. And the other side those that are separate from God, they are still there. So that I know that we use hell and Hades kind of interchangeably, you know, especially in, in our slang, and hopefully not our slang anymore, but perhaps where you might be so mad at someone, you tell them what, go to, don't say it out loud, but you know what I mean, go to hell. And we think that in our minds that the Bible just teaches that that is the end, that hell or Hades is just the end. But in reality, a careful reading of the scriptures will show you that at the end of Revelation, Hades and death is thrown where? Into the lake of fire for eternal separation. So Hades or hell is like a temporary holding place awaiting the fullness of the plan of God. It once held two groups of people. It held those that were righteous in Christ, a righteous in God awaiting the fulfillment of Messiah, and it on, on the torment side and the Haiti side, the, the place of torments holds the people that rejected God. And today they're still there, awaiting final judgment. All the unbelievers will stand at the great white throne judgment and give account for their life. The books will be open and questions asked. The question I believe that will be asked is at the great white throne is what did you do with my son, Jesus? Then those who found in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire, Gehenna, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth that Jesus clearly taught. Peter adds that there's another group of people that were preached to, or not people, but creative beings, another group of beings that were preached to where it says that he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient. Many people believe that these are the Nephilim and the fallen angels and those that are held. There's a specific group of fallen angels that are tied up and awaiting final judgment. I also think that this could, be, this could also refer to his releasing of those taking captivity captive and bringing them into the present, releasing captivity and taking away their captivity and bringing them into the presence of God was also an act of preaching so that not necessarily is he preaching in the sense of giving a second chance because that's very important to understand. There, there is no second chance for the fallen angels and there is no second chance after death for those who reject Jesus Christ. There are no second chances. It's, it's, there, there are none. There's no purgatory. There's no secondary place. There's no levels of heaven. There's no places where you're going to get a second chance. The Bible says that now is the time of salvation, that it's appointed. That's what the Bible says. It is appointed once for a man to die and then the judgment to give account for your life. 
So don't let anyone tell you, well, you know, if you get it kind of right here, you'll get another chance after death. There are no other chances. So this preaching here, even though we use the word preach like evangelistically, like giving a person a chance for, uh, uh, to believe in the gospel, that's not. Jesus comes with absolute authority and he declares his finished work. And those that were awaiting his finished work, what a moment that must have been. And I don't think, even as you study this, I don't think this happened like he sat down, he, he came down into Hades and had everyone sit down. And every, I think it was instantaneous, just like the rapture is going to be. In a blink of like it was a deliverance. It was an ex- expectation. It was already in a place of the old covenant, the, the living under the old covenant by faith. Abraham's bosom was already a place of soothing and warmth and joy and hope. But Jesus now brings them the fulfillment of all that they had waited for. Jesus descends into Hades, not to suffer, not to pay the price of sin, but to deliver. Jesus doesn't give those in torments a second chance. He empties Abraham's bosom and takes them directly into the presence of the Father. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4 now. Ephesians chapter four. And I'm sure after this instruction, everything is so much clearer for you now. (laughs) But now you have reference. It is a question that comes up from time to time of people that are critics of the Bible or people that have been taught differently on this. I mean, there is a popular teaching today. I haven't heard it so much, uh, but there is a popular teaching today on on, uh, Christian television that says, you know, Jesus had to go down into Hades and fight all the demonic realm and fight for salvation. And that's not true. It was finished where? On the cross. Jesus declared it to be finished. They took him down and buried him. And three days later, according to the scripture, he rose again. And yet there was a lot of activity that needed to take place. Notice Ephesians chapter four, verse eight. He says, therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. We just described that. And he gave gifts of men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And then verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And then at the ascension, you know, the Holy Spirit comes days later and the gifts are given through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And all the faithful believers who died waiting for the promise from Adam to the thief on the cross were taken out of Hades. That's why today, as you read through the scriptures, why today paradise is not described as being in the lower parts of the earth. Today, paradise is described as being where? In heaven, Revelation chapter two, verse seven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Paradise is now in the presence of God. Now, let me give you the next difficult section here. And that's this topic of baptism. We won't spend a lot of time on it because you've got a lot to chew on with what we just covered. But here's another passage that's very important to grasp. In verse 21, well, really in verse 20, speaking about the disobedient spirits, the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, which also can be a reference to the rebellious people that died in the flood. So not just spirits, but the rebellious people that died in the flood. And that's, that's where I fall personally. He says, in which only eight souls were saved through water. Okay, that's important. Because now we get to the topic of water baptism. There is also an anti-type which now saves us. And so your ears perk up. And it says, namely, baptism. And some have uh, concluded from this text that the method of salvation from God is water baptism. And some have gone so far to say that the method of salvation is not merely water baptism, but it must be water baptism done according to their precepts and their teachings. In some cases, there's even churches that would declare today that the only way you're saved is in their church, their ministers, their water. (laughs) It's their water. Reservoir doesn't count. It's their water. And it's their special holy anointed water. And anytime someone tells you that you must be saved by a work, any work, they're incorrect. And we know, I went into this in depth, so we're not going to cover it in depth. Just go to our website, 
go to our app and put in the topic, what is water baptism? And I spent a whole study unpacking the biblical truth of water baptism and what it means, what it is, and what it isn't. Now, many will take you here to say and prove to you that water baptism is necessary for salvation. And it's enough to say, very simply, baptism doesn't save anyone. If a person that doesn't have a relationship with God gets into the water, like if we did it here, we did it over at the rec center recently, we're trying to set up another Aurora Reservoir one here soon. If they got in the water, we have the tub set up and they got in the water as an unbeliever and their thinking is, when I go down under the water and come back up, I'm saved. The only thing that's gonna happen to them is they're gonna get wet. That's it. The methodology, the action of water baptism without faith in Jesus Christ does not save anyone, ever. That's why many times here at Calvary, when, you, when somebody asks, well, you know, pastor, I don't understand first. I don't understand. I was baptized as a child. I was baptized as a baby. Should I be baptized again? Well, the answer is yes, because believers are baptized. If baptism is not passive, It's not the passive act of someone conveying to you something, but rather baptism is an active response of a believer in obeying Jesus Christ when he told you to be baptized. And remember, baptism is symbolic. It's powerfully symbolic. The water represents the death of Jesus Christ. So anyone that gets into the water is now walking into the waters of death, identifying publicly. That's why it's to be done, at least one other person, but like why we like to have water baptisms in an extremely public place so that everybody can see one after another, one after another. What are those guys doing over there? I know it's a church, they're doing, what are they doing? And if they came out to see or they're out in the water watching us uh, and they're watching it, they're watching the gospel of Jesus Christ with every single baptism. I, I share the gospel of Jesus Christ often with my mouth. Here's the gospel, you ready? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There isn't anyone among us that's innocent. We have all failed. Some of us have failed more than others, but because God requires perfection, we have fallen because of our own failures, fallen short of the perfection of God. How does a person get into a right relationship with God? They're perfect. And because there's no perfect people among us, none of us can come into a relationship with God. We're helpless. We have no help whatsoever to be right with God because of our failures. But see, knowing that you have sinned against a holy and a righteous God will then reveal to you the Bible declares that while all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, if you don't do something about your mistakes and your failures, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, just like a job. I like the word wages, just like a job. Many of you came here from work today You put in your eight hours, you put in your 10 hours, you put in your 12 hours, some of you 16 hours. Some of you came to service, you go back to work after this. And here's your arrangement, I'm sure. You have an agreement, whether you signed on the dotted line, however you did it, there's your agreement. I go to work for this amount of money, per hour or salary, whatever it is. And so you you work, let's let's say it's 20 bucks an hour, you have an eight hour day. So you go to work and the written, spoken, sign on the dotted line agreement is this. I work for eight hours, I get 20 bucks an hour, so you owe me 160 bucks. Minus taxes, fees, and all that. So you end up walking away with 30 bucks, but that's what you got. <laughs> so so you, you, you have an arrangement and it, it's agreed upon by both parties. The wages of your job today were a certain amount and your company owes you that because you worked for it. That's the agreement. Well, here's the agreement with God. You have sinned and the wages you receive for your sin is death. And you earned it and you deserve it by your own behavior, which could be even considered rebellion against God. I know we don't like to talk like that because it's challenging to who we think we are. We have a tendency of thinking better about ourselves than the condition you know, it's the thing, it's, it's the same thing of, of putting on clothes. 
uh, especially you know, in the context of maybe coming to church or going to work, there, there are certain sets of clothes for different things, right? There's garden clothes, there's church clothes, there's work clothes, there's pajama clothes, you know, there's clothes for everything. But you know, God, the clothes just cover up what God sees all the time. The Bible says that we are naked and open. Our lives are, are exposed before God. There's nothing hidden. And while we might cover things up with nice clothes and nice stuff, it doesn't really cover anything up because we're always exposed before God. So the wages of sin is death. You, nobody is getting out from under that. However, once you come to the conclusion, well, what am I supposed to do? Right now, Ed, it's not really encouraging. What you just said about my life is not encouraging. I don't like it. I don't like you. I don't like this church. I don't even think you're re- representing the Bible. No, no, you got to stick with me. Hold, stay with me for a moment. You'll never understand the glorious gift of God the powerful price of Jesus dying for you until you understand just how much you need it. Just how much you need it. You'll never understand the love of God until you understand how your life and behavior has been so unlovely before God. You have to understand what you're, what, what's owed to you of your life. What's owed to you for your life is not the American dream. It's not smooth sailing. It's not everything that you name and claim. What you and I deserve is death. We deserve it. Because of our behavior, not only were we born in sin, and that's an amazing thing to accept just in and of itself. Sin originated in the Garden of Eden with two perfect people who had for a period of time the best relationship with God you could ever have. It's hard to imagine those of us that have been confined under sin and live in a sinful world and a fallen world, it's hard for us to consider what it would be like to live without sin, without the power of sin, without the presence of sin, without, like it's, it's coming, it's not yet. It's coming, it's not yet. Although we do get a taste of it, don't we? Because I'm certain in your relationship with God by faith, Although you're not sinless, I'm sure that there's a lot less sin in your life than it used to be. Anyone amen that? Like you have a new life, a new, your new creation. So, so you've got to realize the condition of your life. And until you realize, it, it's, it's I'm sure what a doctor does very often, especially those doctors as even as we were praying that have to give cancer diagnoses, you've got to know the truth. As hard as it is to hear those words, you have to know the truth. A doctor would be unable to give you the kind of treatment you need unless you come to terms with the reality of how bad it is. How much more than a medical condition is a spiritual condition? The wages of sin is death. But you know, if you were to look that scripture up in the Bible, it doesn't end there. Because the very next breath, you could say the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. There is a gift to receive. You mean, wait a minute, Ed, it's not so hopeless after? It's not so hopeless after all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That tonight, you can enter into a personal relationship with God. You can come directly to Jesus Christ You don't come through me. You don't come through this church. You don't come through this radio station or YouTube. The Bible says that by faith, you can come directly to Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you say, well, wait, then then how am I, how do I receive the forgiveness of sins? Well, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Confession speaks of agreeing with God. It speaks of saying out loud the condition of your life related to sin. The Bible goes on to say, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. The interesting thing about the gospel is it doesn't involve works of righteousness. I mean, if the first part of what I shared is true, and I think all of us know it is, even on a practical level, even if it's not a spiritual level, if what I just shared is true, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death, 
then what work could you possibly offer to God that would cover all the failures in your life? You think water would do it? Do you really think water would wash away? I mean, would, would, God send God, would God send God in the flesh, the son, Jesus Christ, to be tortured and beaten, hung on a Roman cross to die a prolonged, horrific death if water could save you? Which brings us back to the text. And by the way, in a few moments, near and far, you have the opportunity to receive Jesus. Because I know some of you, you've got this internal, this internal thing going on inside of you. And you're wrestling with what I just said. And I'm grateful for that. That internal thing that's happening is the Holy Spirit of God speaking directly to you personally. <laughs> that he would be so kind and so generous to us to pursue us every day of our lives. It's not water that saves. So when you read in verse 21, this anti-type, which now saves us, namely baptism, it's like Peter anticipated it and said, it's not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's not what water does in cleaning a body. It's a spiritual thing. There is a spiritual component of water baptism. Why? Because it represents, when you remember we walk into the water, we walk into the water, you're walking into the death of Jesus, and then we'll pray with you and we'll take you under the water, which has you now buried with Christ, and then we're going to bring you right back up out of the water, which represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in those folks that are watching the baptism over and over and over and over again, what are they seeing? The gospel. The life, the death, and the resurrection. So what I just shared with you verbally, what, what I just shared with you, gospel to your ears, water baptism becomes the gospel to your eyes. Because the person obeying Jesus is identifying publicly the death, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's why it's important that we do it publicly. It's the best that we can. So there are witnesses so that you are wit testifying. You know, if you're, you receive Jesus Christ and you're baptized the same day, you are already sharing the gospel. You're already doing it outwardly and openly. A lot of people are afraid to share the gospel audibly, but God will deal with that fear over time. But when you're water baptized, you share the gospel. You come to a water baptism, you're watching it over and over and over again, commemorating and by symbolism, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I know you'll meet people that try to hang some water baptism trip on you. Don't let them. Peter is not talking about the institution of water baptism here. It's not the context at all. He's talking about water, but a whole lot more. Was it water that saved Noah? Yes or no, church? Was it water that saved Noah? Was it an ark that saved Noah? Who saved Noah? God. God saved Noah. The ark doesn't get credit for it. The water definitely didn't save Noah. God saved Noah. The water actually was the water of judgment. The flood coming on the world as a judgment of God. So with Noah, if we, had to, if we had to have Noah here, we got to interview him, say, okay, Noah, what saved you? You know, it's, it's I got to get in. I got to get in the ark. I have to obey God. God has prepared a way for me to not experience the judgment that he brings on the earth. That's what Noah would say. You wouldn't believe it. Like he would probably share it with us like we didn't know the story. You would not believe what happened. I was just there one day and God spoke to me and said, build a big boat. I'm like, I don't want to build a big boat. It's so huge. I don't know. What are my neighbors going to say? No, you know, he's going to give you the whole story. And then, then people were mocking me. But every time I was doing, I was just telling them, no, God is good. He's faithful. I'm just going to obey. And remember, Noah was called what? A preacher of righteousness. So his obedience was also a message to everyone around him. And so you go, well, no, what, tell me what saved you. Well, you know what? All I know is this. God said, get in the ark. That's what he told me to do. Get in the ark. Get in the ark. The ark. The ark of God. That fabulous, glorious picture of the unsinkable work of God in saving a soul. 
the only way to avoid the water, this is the exact opposite of what people make it say, the only way to avoid the waters of judgment was to get in that ark. You could only be saved God's way, not your way. You could take your chances, you know, you could try to swim for a while, you're not going to make it. You can try to hang on to things, you're not going to make it. The only ones that saved, what did he say? Only eight souls were saved. Why? Because they obeyed God and they did it God's way. Remember what Jesus said in John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So here's the thing, this is beautiful. And we, we don't have time to develop it, but here's what happens. The ark becomes a picture and a type of Jesus the ark. When the floods came, there was only one way to be saved. And do you know that anyone that got in the ark would have been saved? Anyone, any human being that got in the ark, they would have been saved. It's unfortunate only eight did, but anyone would have. That was the only way. So that today, the only way to be saved is to not come into an ark or some big boat. The way to be saved is to come into Jesus. That's it. There's no other way. There is absolutely no other alternative but then to come the way God says. He says, if you, Jesus said, you desire to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. This is the only way. The only way is to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then therefore you'll be saved to repent of your sins. It's not water baptism. And so we don't talk about Noah and the water today. I mean, think about what you say, maybe the Sunday school teachers among us, and you come to that section in Genesis. It's not, okay, kids, we're going to learn about Noah and the water today. No, what do you say? We're going to learn about Noah and the ark today. Why? Because it was the ark that saved him. God used the ark to save him, not the water. And here in Peter, he's saying the same thing. He's giving, it's a little more complicated the way he says it. But the believers in the first century, I think, understood exactly what. This must have been along the lines of what they've been wrestling with under great duress and stress, just really, um, really wrestling with this. Let me give you a couple more things and then we'll leave. Go to Genesis chapter 7. And I want to show you another. First, I want to show you Genesis and then I want to give you one more thing about water baptism that you can mark in your Bibles um, so that anybody that comes to you, you can just see it in their own Bibles. Genesis chapter 7. Um, notice with me in verse 13. So go all the way back. It's not Noah and the water, it's Noah and the ark. Because the waters did not save him. You get into the ark, you're saved. You get into Jesus, you're saved. Notice Genesis 7 verse 13. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind Cattle after their kind, creeping thing, creeps on the earth after their kind, birds after their kind, every bird of every sort, verse 15, they went into the ark. Just mark that. That's a type of Jesus. They went into, they entered into a covering relationship. The ark became their place of safety. They, you could say that the ark was vicarious. It took, it took the place of their vulnerability. They went into the ark and two by two, all the flesh that was in the breath. So those that entered male and feel of all flesh went in, including the animals and the humans. They went in as God had commanded him. And then you can't miss. I don't know if you've ever known this before. I don't know if you've ever seen it before, but I need you to see it. They went into the ark and they shut the door and locked it. And they ran outside and freaked out because they didn't know what they're going to do with the door. It doesn't say that. It says, the Lord shut him in. Which tells me it would have been impossible for them to close the door on their own. They could have spent the whole time trying to close it and the waters would have been raising and it would have filled the ark. But no, the Lord shut him in. And that's how it happens when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He shuts you in. Or as Peter said earlier in 1 Peter, you are kept by the power of God. It wasn't, Mo, it wasn't Noah's ingenuity. It wasn't his building skills. It wasn't the fact that they put, he did exactly what he was told. It wasn't any of that. You know what it was? It was the saving power of God keeping his word. And he shut them in. 
and they were taken care of. One more thing before you go. Turn over to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. The most popular verse. This one actually isn't the most popular verse. It's just used often because people like to confuse you. And then when, you don't, when you're in the midst of confusion, then they insert their view. Uh, and so you, you can set this aside. Here's one that is very popular, and I think we need to see it before we leave. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And you may have already heard this, but by, and this is why I want you guys to write this in your Bible, because if somebody takes you to Acts 2.38, I'll tell you right where to go, right where to go. Okay, so notice with me in Acts 2.38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then there's the key word, for the remission of sins, that you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And a simple reading of that, I can see how someone could conclude that you are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, so, so that you get the forgiveness of your sins when you're baptized. So that word for can have two meanings. It can be both causative and it can also be resultant. Causative, that word might sound familiar. It can be the cause of something. And that's how people want to look at it. If you're baptized, it causes salvation. Now, we just went into depth how that can't be possible, but I understand how you can interpret the English language that way. It can cause salvation. You are baptized for to be saved. So therefore, you go backwards and say you can't be saved without water baptism. However, the word for could also be resultant. Let me give you an example. Some of you have served faithfully in the military and you have done great exploits. And when you come back from maybe deployment or something that you did, you're invited to a ceremony and you are received, uh, I probably should have talked to you beforehand because I, I really don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but let's just say you get a medal of some sort for courage, some medal for courage. And so you come back from war and you have fought a valiant fight and you are recognized for your courage. So what? you come and you're in a ceremony and then whoever your commanding officer is, they place that medal on you and they say, I give you this medal for your courage. So does that mean that the medal gave the soldier the courage? No. We use the word for that's basically saying, I'm giving you this medal because of your courage. Because of what you've already done. I'm not giving it to you now, here's your medal, and then I'm going to send you out, and that medal is going to be somehow giving you courage. No, it represents the courage you've already demonstrated. And that's what I suggest to you that Acts 2.38 is saying. You are baptized as a result of your salvation. It doesn't save you. And you go, wait, wait a minute, what does that mean? Okay, so here in your Bible, right next to this, 10 colon 43, because we're going to go to chapter 10 of Acts, verse 43. So go with me, chapter 10, verse 43. It's just a real simple way. You want to understand causative, you want to understand resultant, because we use that language all the time. And I suggest to you that this is a resultant use of the word, and I'll show you why. Notice now, Peter is speaking again, chapter 10, same Peter, preaching the same message of salvation, and notice what he says in verse 43. He says, to him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. He doesn't mention water baptism at all. Who, who is it that receives the remission of sins? Those that believe. You guys with me so far? No mention of water baptism. This is the same guy. So he's either right in both occasions or he's wrong in one and write in another, which would place the scriptures in a place of contradiction that they simply aren't. So I suggest to you so far that he's right in both of them. He's saying the exact same thing in both of them. Now, from chapter 10, right next to that one, chapter 16, verse 31. Chapter 16, verse 31. This is where the Philippian jailer is converted and notice what he is told. Verse 30, he asked the question that some of you may be asking right now. Sirs, pastor, guy, what must I do to be saved? What is it that I have to do? That is the, I mean, aren't you just waiting for people to ask you that question? Like, wouldn't that be, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to be saved? 
And don't tell them come to church. Don't tell them uh, you got to read the Bible. Don't tell me any works. There's the answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be water baptized. No, no, actually it doesn't say that. It says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you, what does your Bible say? Will be saved, you and your household. Look at verse 34, same chapter, verse 34. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. And we know he believed in God because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So water baptism is the result of salvation. And that's why we believe in a doctrine known as believer's baptism. Believers get baptized, not unbelievers. And it's because you're a believer that you're baptized. Why? Because you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So Father, thank you for going through with us and helping us to grasp a little more this challenging text and learning, Lord, that it's the truth about salvation that sets us free. You you said you shall know the truth and the truth will set us free. And that's our desire to know and live in the truth. And I'm grateful that you didn't place salvation outside of our reach You didn't place it under, you know, like whether we live a a perfect life or we keep doing the right things or we are perfect in all our ways or we follow all the religious traditions or we do everything the priest told us to do or uh, any of those things. That you have finished the work and we receive the forgiveness of our sins vicariously. And even for us, we live under the new covenant So there was no waiting for the fulfillment. It's all done. And so, Father, I pray today for those listening that this would be the moment of truth for them. That they would be so um, stirred in their heart and in their minds and that they would respond to that work of your spirit in their life. They would understand and receive the fullness of your love for them just like a mom or a dad loves their children. We don't try to make it harder for them. We try to make it easier for them. Like in a marriage, in that mutual love between a husband and a wife, we don't try to make it harder for one another. We try to make it easier to love and to serve. We're motivated by such a great move of care and concern. And so today, if you're here and you're, like you're just moved by a love that I mean, to think about why would, God didn't even have to do this for us, but he pursued us to rescue us, to change us, to forgive us, to give us hope and a future. And I would say, if you're here today and you'd say to me, Ed, I need to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus because I do believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you. Today would be the day. God bless you over here. Today would be the day. You guys out on the radio and the online, I know we don't see you or downstairs. It's okay because it's not for us. You're standing for you. And you know, your life is going to be one of taking a stand for the truth. And it might cost you. It might be difficult. God bless you guys in the back, but it's going to be worth it. The, The truth of God's work in your life, the reality of his forgiveness, it's just beyond, I always... I'm a loss for words. I can't describe it properly. Even the best that I think I can do, I don't even touch the surface of God's love for you. His un, I mean, to experience unconditional love, unbelievable. Anyone else? Anyone else? I'm so always encouraged on a Wednesday night. I was saved on a Wednesday night. Just like here, just coming to a service in the middle of the week. God bless you guys. God loves you. He really does. And so, Cal, if you could come up with this family. I can't see you in the back. Maybe Avan or someone back in the back over here. Maybe a pastor is sitting back there somewhere. I don't know. I can't see who's back there. Byron. Pastor Byron. Go for it. And a brother of believers can do it. It's all right. You want to surround the people that are in your, in your section? Great. Go for it. 
And it's okay if you open your eyes during prayer too. It's all right. You can see the work of God. You want to see the work of God? Open your eyes. See the work of God, the miraculous power to save a soul. Go ahead. Do it. And by faith, by faith we see you. We see you by faith listening on the radio in your car. Like the note we got recently, standing up at your kitchen table. We see you. The Lord does. And so pray with me, would you? Because I want to help you confess. That's what the Bible says. So so I'm going to help you with a prayer you can say directly to God. You can say, God, I admit that I've sinned against you. And I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me. And I believe Jesus rose again from the dead to save my soul. And I turn away from my sinful past. And I've decided to follow you from this day forward. And Father, anyone, anywhere that's praying today with us, I pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon them. I pray you begin to give them great revelation. I pray you give them hope in their marriage, hope in their life, hope in their battles, hope in their addictions, hope in their incarcerations, hope in their medical issues, hope in their abandonment, hope in their trauma, hope in their hurt, that Lord, wherever they're coming from, that you would begin to replace hopelessness with hope and replace fear with courage and confidence that they will grow in grace. Bless them, Lord, as we rejoice with the angels in heaven today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.